Hi all! Today we will learn how to write a shellcode for solving challenges for week 3. Shellcode is an opcode snippet that CPU can understand and run. And what it does is basically it lets the program inherit the privilege and spawns a shell, which is the program that let us uh, interact with the command line and finally uh, let you read the flag. We do this because in the challenges of week two, we have a very kind of uh, the get a shell function that does this job. However, we will never have such a convenient function in the real attached targets. So we need to learn about that, how we can create it and use that. Before we start, uh, let's do a little bit of a recap about the previous lecture. Uh, we have learned that uh, how to exploit a buffer overflow vulnerability and to do that uh, we need to locate the vulnerability that receives the user input more than the buffer size to override the uh, local variable say the ABP or like a return address on the stack and then put a longer data than the buffer can uh, contain uh, to override the return address in this case uh, in order to change the program's uh, control flow to where uh, we can change that to the get a shell function uh, which I prepared for you uh, to spawn a privileged command line shell and you can run cat flag uh, to read the flag next uh, we learned about how we can exploit the frame pointer attack uh, uh, how, how we launched the frame pointer attack and this attack covers that even if we cannot overwrite the return address up to this point if we only if we can only overwrite the save dbp or part of it yeah uh, we can change the stack frame after the first return and by uh, carefully controlling the save dbp uh, by changing the stack frame on the second return uh, we can uh, make the program fetch the return address from our fake stack so finally we can control the return address uh, of the program on the second return and the method is quite simple uh, we need to set the saved EBP to where the your input uh, can be located and then that address plus 4 4 if you put the return address then the second return uh, will be returning to yours uh, the return address specified by you and from tutorial videos and text files that I shared on our course website uh, you have learned some uh, usage of the pawn tools uh, that we can write a program uh, in Python to exploit the pro uh, the to write an exploit uh, so please uh, uh, please learn about the how how to use pawn tools uh, like this and we use tmux pawn tools gdb at the same time interactively to examine what's happening in the program's execution so please be familiar with those tools asap using these links uh, because we will use such tools a lot in coming weeks and uh, uh, getting familiar to these asap will reduce your time on solving the challenges okay uh, let's start the topic for today and the topic for today is writing shellcode that is writing your own get a shell function so as i previously mentioned in the challenges in uh, for week two uh, we changed the program's return address to a get a shell function and what that function does is that it will grant you the higher privilege required for reading the flag. So after running this, if you run cat flag, you can get the flag something like this. And I intentionally put this function for your convenience, which means uh, you guys can focus only at the overriding the return address, not about like the finding where to return. So jumping to the get a shell function, I'll do all the jobs for you for required things for the reading the flag. However, in a realistic case, there will be no such function like a get a shell. For instance, 
I bet you guys have never wrote a get a shell function in the code in any of your C or C++ assignment before taking this class. So basically in the real attack target programs, there will be no such a convenience function that if you jump to the sum of the function, it will spawn a shell. Yeah, there will be no function like that. In such a case, in the realistic case, uh, the question is like the main question uh, in uh, today is like that where do we need to return uh, to have a successful buffer overflow attack and the answer is very simple if there is a no get a shell function then make it so so we will learn how to make the get a shell function uh, using the shell code so today we will learn how to create such a function as an opcode because like the what we will do is like that we will not code this function in C or C++. What we will do is we will use assembly language to write this function and then change that as an opcode string. So opcode string is like a stream of the input that you can put uh, as we do uh, in like the uh, putting lots of A's, A, 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 and the return address. So as part of our input, we can put the shell code on it and then we can jump to there. And before doing that, uh, let's see what the get a shell function does. So this is the source code of the get a shell function. Uh, what it does is that it first inherit the current privilege of the program uh, using the set regid and get egid, these kind of the two functions. And then it will execute the shell uh, which is the bin bash, the shell command line program uh, using exec l uh, function. And I put some of the uh, explanation of the each of the function, but briefly, uh, the function get egid, what it does is like it will return the effective gid, the privilege that we get during the execution, yeah. uh, which let us uh, read the flag. And then, the set regid function, if we supply this effective gid to these two arguments, what it does is like the, it will set the real and effective gid uh, with the argument. And if we supply the effective gid uh, retrieved from the get egid function to uh, both of these arguments, what it does is like the, it will set the real and effective gid as a current effective gid. So basically, it will do privilege escalation and your group ID will be the, uh, the group ID of the, the target program, then you can read the flag. Next, uh, there was an exact L function uh, which executes a new program, and in the shell code, we will learn, uh, run a new shell program, uh, bin bash, and maybe the bin sh, uh, because that's, uh, uh, that has a more shorter uh, a path name and we will not directly use the exact L function because this is a library function and instead of that uh, we will use the function exact VE there are lots of function in the ES e exact family but the, we will use exact VE the last function because the, that's available in the operating systems uh, system call and I will explain what is system call later but please note that, that we will use this exact VE function and then the set the file path as a bin sh, bin slash bin slash sh, and then put zero on the, these two arguments. Now, let's talk a little more about shellcode. Uh, I mentioned that in the real attack case, uh, we will mostly never have a get a shell like functions in our attack target. So in such a case, we need to create a shell code and then put that in the program, then we can jump to the shell code. And to inherit the privilege and execute the shell, uh, what we need to do in the shell code is just calling these three functions, get egid first, and then put that as an argument of the set regid and call that to change the real and effective gid to the uh, group id of the uh, the at the target program and then exec ve bin sh to spawn a shell after that you can run cat flag 
For our convenience, uh, we can ignore the arguments and environment variable part of the exact VE. So you, we can just put zero on like these two arguments, but we need to put the correct path name for the uh, shell command line uh, program. And if we generate this these uh, function calls as a opcode, supply that to the program as our input, and if we run on it, then the CPU will run these functions for us, and then you can uh, cat flag. You can run cat flag. To illustrate how we use the shellcode, uh, let me show you a conceptual diagram. Uh, what we will do is that, uh, because there is a no get a shell function, uh, we will put our shellcode somewhere in the program's memory. That could be in as your input. In that case, like a shellcode could be like placed in like the uh, starting from buffer somewhere here or programs arguments then the putting in somewhere here or environment variables or programs name which is then like located at the upper part of the stack and then we will learn about the, how we put the shellcode in the next lecture on like next Tuesday and then what we need to do is like after putting the shellcode on the stack or somewhere in the memory then we can overwrite the return address as the uh, address of the shellcode. Then, when this function returns, it will return to the opcode that we uh, wrote, and then that will run get EGID, set EGID, exact the BNSH, and we can inherit the privilege and run the shell command line, and that's it. And to do that, uh, we need to know how to call these three functions, get EGID, set EGID, and exact VE. Yeah. And then, fortunately, uh, these three functions are system calls, uh, which are API functions of the operating system. So system call is a, you can regard that as a, like the uh, APIs available from operating systems. So, uh, you can regard that as like they're having a function call to the operating system and then operating system opens a lot lots of functionality uh, as a system call for like a file network io memory allocation or uh, privilege escalation or run the pro running the program and like because of like these parts are like handled by the operating system so these three functions are available as a system call and uh to you may uh, to learn more about this, uh, what kind of the system calls are available, uh, you may refer to the following two links uh, at the bottom for which system calls are available in 32-bit or 64-bit Intel Linux. And then uh, let me give an example of how you can invoke a system call in 32-bit x86 machine. 64-bit uh, one has a different thing, so I have a slide for that but uh, let's focus on the 32-bit one first. So first, you can put the value of EAX as the system call target system call number. So for example, if you want to call get EGID, this system call first, then you need to refer to the uh, link here, 32-bit, the system call number, search for the get EGID, then you can get the system call number 50. And then, like the, we can use uh, some of the uh, uh, symbol uh, sys get EGID, and then we need to set the system call number to the EAX register to invoke the system call. So you can regard EAX as a function selector. And then, if there is a, any kind of arguments, fortunately, the get EGID system call uh, does not require any kind of arguments, so we can just invoke that. But if there is a, any kind of the arguments, are required for the, the system call, then in 32-bit uh, x86 processor uh, with the running with the Linux, uh, we need to put the first argument uh, to the system call to EBX the EBX register, second one to ECX, third one to EDX, fourth one to ESI, fifth one to EDI. So EBX, ECX, EDX, ESI, EDI, Maybe uh, you can memorize like it's better to memorize like this kind of order because you will use like this a lot. Yeah. And after setting the arguments, so in this case, we don't need the argument for the get EGIDs and then ignore this at this time. Then to actually run the function, 
you can invoke a software interrupt uh, number 0x80 and uh, that can be done by running the instruction int $0x80 so this is like the, uh, the command to invoke the system call so the assembly lines for calling get EGID uh, would be move the system call number sys get EGID to EAX and then run int 0x80 that's it then the system call will be invoked the software interrupt will let the operating system to handle the system call and then the operating system runs and return to the program and the, as it does with the same as a, the function return the EAX register will hold the return value of the get EGID so we previously put the number 50 on EAX and then but the after running the int 0x80 uh, it will run the operating system part and then return to the program in that case the value of the EAX register will be changed to the return value of the get EGID for the next then how can he call the set regid function uh, with the arguments as the return value of the get EGID the first thing that we know is that the EAX register holds the return value of the get EGID and then the second argu uh, first argument should be stored in EBX and then second argument should be stored into ECX so after running these two lines what we can do is move the return value the return value of the get EGID to EBX and ECX then we set the uh, first the real GID and then second effective GID the arguments and then move the system call value of the set regid which is a 71 to eax and then int 0x80 then it will invoke the second function call uh, by supplying the return value of the get egid as an as arguments of the set regid and then next is for invoking exact ve uh, we want to run exact ve with the address of the string uh, bin sh as the first argument and then second and third arguments as a zero so we will just for uh, we will just put null for like the null which is a zero uh, for argument and then environment variable pointer uh, for our convenience because uh, it doesn't matter uh, it doesn't matter and then like the make uh, having a null uh, will make the shell code short and then convenient and to this end, uh, you can first put the system call number of the exact VE, which is 11 in 32 bit machine, uh, to EAX. And then uh, we need to put the address of this uh, uh, string BNSH to EBX, 0 to ECX, and 0 to EDX, and int 0x80. And I believe that putting the system call number move instruction with the sys EX ECV and to EAX and then move 0 to ECX, move 0 to EDX, and int 0x80, these are all easy but how can you put the address of the sum of the string uh, to the EVX register? Maybe you, you might be curious about that and to do that we can create a string uh, on, on the stack by using some of the instructions and in this example uh, instead of putting the 7 bytes slash bin slash sh uh, I will put slash slash bin sh because like having additional slash is ignored by the operating system yeah so which is aligned as an 8 bytes so aligned uh, to the 4 byte granularity for the 64 bit or 32 bit processor so better to have like this kind of the aligned bytes so I will just put slash slash bin sh instead of the slash bin sh and uh, in the operating system meaning of the, these two string will be the same uh, just finding the shell uh, command line uh, program and to do that we can put the zero on the stack by running push zero so we can push zero at here and then push the last four bytes n slash sh uh, which can be translated as a n slash s H because the numbers are a little ambient in Intel x86 so we put this number at here and then we put slash slash bi slash 
slash b i this number to the stack and then if we so the so ESP will be starting here push 0 push the second number push the third number now the ESP is at here and then if we read the data starting from ESP so for example after running these three lines on GDB if you do x slash s ESP then it will print out slash slash b i n slash s h and null like this so we can build a string on this track and right now ESP points to the start address of the stack then to put the address of the this string what we can do is just move ESP to EDX that's the secret that uh, you can create the string and then put the string on the EBX register then you can invoke the exactly system call using int 0x80 so now we just learned about the, how we can invoke the system calls in 32-bit then how can we invoke a system call in 64-bit uh, Intel machine uh, there are very small changes first uh, system call numbers are different uh, we use 50, 71, uh, 11 for the each of the system call, but in the 64-bit Linux, it has a different uh, system call number. So please refer to the link that I provide in this slide, uh, slide number 13, uh, to refer to the like the system call number for the 64-bit Linux. And then I just uh, kindly put like the, all the required thing here, so you can just uh, refer to the slide. And then the second one, uh, the the a second one, the argument passing uh, registers are different. So we will use the same register, uh, EAX, but the, in this case, RAX, the A, uh, RAX, the 64-bit uh, EAX register, yeah, to pass the system call number, so to, uh, to set the system call number. But to pass the arguments, uh, in 32-bit, we were using EBX, ECX, EDX, ESI EDI for the like the order of the like the arguments, but in this case uh, we will use uh, RDI RSI RDX RCX R8 R9, which is the same uh, order of the function call uh, to pass the arguments uh, to the system call. So note that the arguments passing the registers are different uh, to with the 32-bit one. And finally, in 64-bit CPU, we have a special instruction for invoking the system call. Uh, the instruction name is the syscall. So in this case, we do not use this kind of the int 0x80, uh, which is the system call invoking uh, instruction for the 32-bit uh, Linux. Uh, we will not use that in 64-bit, and we will just use a syscall uh, instruction. And another caveat to in writing the shellcode is that if your shellcode contains zero bytes, then it will not get passed through some of the string operation functions, such as like a scanf or a string copy. So, for example, uh, if there is a buffer overflow vulnerability, but uh, if the program uses scanf to get your input, then if you have like some of the instructions, something like this. So previously. When we build a, a BinSH string, we might want to use push zero to mark the null bytes here. Yeah. But if we use that, it will contain zero bytes, then there could be some of the shell code, upcodes, and then this code, and then there will be some of the more code in here, but uh, your input will be truncated uh, when it meets the null bytes. So you cannot deliver all your shell code to the program's input if you have a zero byte in your shellcode. And to avoid such cases, uh, we need to remove the zero bytes from your shellcode. And to do that, uh, this is not that uh, uh, complicated. We can create zero instead just putting zero in the code. And what that means is that, uh, for example, if, you, if we want to put the zero to EAX, what we can do is Instead of the moving zero directly to EAX, we can move some of the value to EAX and then subtract the same value from EAX. As a result, uh, our opcode will never contain zero, but the result of the EAX value will be zero. After that, to push zero, what we can do is after doing this, we can push EAX. Then it will push zero on the stack. 
And a similar trick would be if we run XOR, EAX, EAX. So the exclusive OR on the same number will always be zero. So after this, after running this, the value of the EAX will be zero. And then if we move that value to EBX, then EBX will be also zero too. Important thing here is that the, your opcode will never have zero at all if you use these kind of the instructions. And in the challenges of week three, there are some other restrictions to write shellcode. For example, not just for the like the uh, uh, not having zero bytes. Uh, for instance, some challenge requires uh, you to only use ASCII characters uh, in writing shellcode. For instance, uh, uh, and then this mimics like the sum of the input function uh, can only accept uh, ASCII characters. So yeah, it resembles some of the realistic cases for that. And then some other require you to use only the alphanumeric characters, which is A to Z, uh, capital and slower A to Z and the numbers. And then this case uh, mimics uh, the case that the, uh, some of the application firewall uh, try to reject like non-English characters or non-human writable characters in their input. So yeah, you need to write uh, uh, so in some cases, you have to write the uh, shellcode in the alphanumeric uh, characters. And also, maybe there could be limit in length and etc. So I prepare all the challenges for that. So please use your crea creativity, uh, maximum creativity, uh, to write the shellcode that meets such restriction. And in the tutorial today, I will demonstrate how you can write the shellcode in 32-bit and 64-bit and also removes a zero from those two shellcode. And for further challenges, uh, that has this kind of the restrictions are on yours. So the assignment for week three, uh, please write and use your shellcode. Uh, try to do fetch week three uh, from your home directory first. And the challenges are, uh, we have a shellcode writing challenge for 32-bit and 64-bit, and then non-zero shellcode for 32-bit and 64-bit. And up to these challenges, we will have tutorials for today. And for the others, uh, short shellcode. Yeah. This challenge will require you to write a shellcode shorter than 12 bytes. And uh, uh, and then if you make the 12 bytes one, then the, you will get the 20 points. But if you can uh, generate the more shorter co code, for example, 11 bytes, then you will have extra 10 points, 10 bytes, then extra 20 points. And then if you can go for two bytes, then you can get extra 100 points. Maybe if you can go one bytes, then extra 110 points. So basically, uh, the number of character you reduced from the 12 characters, so if that is uh, seven characters, then five characters reduced, then you will get 50 more points as an extra credit. So try to minimize your shellcode and then exploit the thing. And then please write the uh, how many bytes and then write down the shellcode that you use uh, and also describe the how you can uh, exploit, use that and exploit the uh, shellcode challenge uh, in your write-up. Then I will manually check that and then grant uh, extra credit points. And for the ASCII shellcode 64, uh, the shellcode uh, requires you to only uh, use like the bytes from 0, 01 to 7F, which are the ASCII code. So there's a restrictions in the like the how you can choose the opcodes. Uh, so you may not use some of the instructions. For example, XOR, EAX, EAX, the opcode is 31C0. Uh, you cannot use that because the second byte is a C0, which is out of this range. And in alphanumeric shellcode, which will be the most difficult one, uh, this is an extra credit challenge, uh, which worth uh, 100 points. And it requires you to write the shellcode, only use a capital A to Z and uh, A from Z, yeah, and then lower A to Z and 0 to 9. So only use like a 0 to 9, A to Z, A to Z, yeah. And uh, if you write the shellcode in this fashion, then like you can actually speak your shellcode uh, verbally. Yeah. And the due date for these challenges are on April 27th. So please take enough time to write shellcodes and please have fun.
and don't forget to come to uh, today's uh, uh, tutorial and then I will demonstrate uh, how you can uh, write a shellcode for these two uh, types of the uh, shellcode and then the, I will upload the video for tutorial after we finish the tutorial on uh, 4 p.m. Yeah. So tutorial will start at 3 p.m. and then after it finishes I will upload the video and then share that uh, share the link on the website canvas and discord. Thank you.